Thank you for joining us today as we commemorate the 80th anniversary of the initial attack at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, that involved America in the war in the Pacific. Here at the National Museum of the Pacific War, we remember so many of those who served. In places like this, for example, a commemorative wall dedicated solely to those involved in Pearl Harbor. I'd like to introduce you now to Brian Degner, our Education Outreach Coordinator, who's going to take you inside the museum and introduce you to an exhibit about Pearl Harbor there. Welcome to the National Museum of the Pacific War, located in Fredericksburg, Texas, the hometown of Admiral Chester Nimitz, who would become the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Area of Operation during World War II. Now, I am currently inside the museum, just outside our Pearl Harbor exhibit, at an area known as a nation unprepared for war. And you probably recognize this image. It is the famous Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And this one took place just a few weeks before the attack on Pearl Harbor. And I would be willing to bet you that the majority of these people that are whether they're in the parade or those viewing the parade thought that within a couple of weeks, we would be at war with Japan. Now there had been some talk that we might go to war with Japan, but most people scoffed at that idea because they did not believe that a small island nation like Japan would attack a large nation like the United States. But of course, they were wrong. And on December the 7th, 1941, the Japanese launched their surprise attack against the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. And we're here today to commemorate the 80th anniversary of that historical event, a date which will live in infamy. The Japanese had began planning the attack on Pearl Harbor almost a year in advance of that December the 7th, 1941 date. And part of the plans called for the use of what they considered a secret weapon, and that was their midget or mini submarines. Now, not everyone was on board with this, though, because there was a fear that the use of these midget submarines just might give away the element of surprise. And that's exactly what almost happened. Now let's go take a look at one of those five Japanese midget subs that tried to enter Pearl Harbor on that morning, 80 years ago, HA-19. 3.30 a.m. on the morning of December the 7th, 1941, Imperial Japanese Navy submarine I-24, the mothership, which had piggybacked HA-19 to its release location 7 to 10 miles from the entrance of Pearl Harbor. And from the moment it was released, HA-19 experienced problems. Ensign Sakamaki, the skipper of this vessel, could not steer it properly. The guidance system had messed up, but he was intent on carrying out his mission. He eventually made it to the entrance of Pearl Harbor, where numerous times he attempted to enter that restricted area, but each time he ran into a coral reef. After being fired upon shortly after the aerial attack had began there at Pearl Harbor, it broke HA-19 loose from that coral reef that it had been stuck on. Now, Sakamaki and his crew member were knocked unconscious. They were able to regain consciousness, try to restart the vessel, then they experienced a depth charge attack. That's when the compartment of the sub began to fill with water, shorting out those batteries and putting out fumes and smoke that once again rendered Sakamaki and his crew member unconscious. So now, throughout the rest of the battle and into Sunday night, HA-19 simply drifted uh, there in the ocean. After regaining consciousness, Ensign Sakamaki ordered his fellow crew member to abandon ship. And then Sakamaki set off the explosive charge. They did not want HA-19 to fall into the hands of the enemy. That even failed. Now, unfortunately, Sakamaki's crew member drowned in the surf. But Sakamaki was able to make it to shore where the following morning he was captured and he would become prisoner number one, the first Japanese prisoner of war of World War II. Now, it was dishonorable to surrender 
He was to die for his emperor, and he begged his American captors to allow him to kill himself. Naturally, he refused. And he would spend the rest of the war as prisoner number one before being released and returning home at the end of World War II. In 1990, the museum acquired HA-19. And a year later, in 1991, the 50th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, in Sakamaki was here in Fredericksburg. And for the first time in over 50 years, he was able to lay eyes on a vessel that he had abandoned 50 years ago, and he wept. Another artifact that we have in our Pearl Harbor exhibit here at the museum is a hatch off of the USS Arizona. This hatch was part of the superstructure that was removed when it was determined that the battleship could not be raised or salvaged and they had to get it out of the way. On this door, you can see the oil line where below that, everything else was underwater. The oval-shaped hole up here in the corner, that was cut by a blowtorch by rescuers looking for men that might have been trapped behind this door. And I know every time I look at this door, I think of those over a thousand sailors and marines that are entombed in the USS Arizona Memorial, their final resting place. Sadly, there are very few Pearl Harbor survivors still alive today. Eighty years have passed since that faithful morning. But here at the National Museum of the Pacific War, we will continue to honor them and to tell their stories. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Just as I got out on the quarter deck, well, I could see that guy coming to play. And about that, another, another 10 minutes, I'd have been going to shore. And uh, I heard all kind of noise. I went to the porthole, and when I looked out, the Arizona was facing me. And I went on top side. Is when I saw that it, it, there was something going on that wasn't right. Then that plane passed just over us, and I could see him, he waved at me. On the morning of December 7th, uh, I was waiting on the street, waiting for my neighbor so we could walk to Sunday school at eight o'clock. Approximately about 7.45, I heard a roar of an aircraft flying very low, which caught my attention. So immediately I looked up and I saw this aircraft banking to the left between two houses and I had a clear view of the pilot and automatically I just went and waved and in some ways I thought he acknowledged my wave by banking this way I thought he was waving at me and I just you know, didn't pay attention to the plane after that you couldn't see that but smoke there was Frightening, all the bombs going off, the torpedoes going off, the ships are sinking, and people are having to go ashore because the ship sunk or be picked up by tugs. The whole ocean could get a fire. So finally, after we had saved 33 of them, they stopped us because they didn't tell us what would happen. Immediately after, I heard my mom yelling at me frantically, get in the house, come on home, get in the house. But we was lucky, we got hit with a shrapnel bomb. We had 150 holes. I was on the USS California. We lost 104, we lost six officers, 98 personnel. Later on in the afternoon, I noticed that you could smell all the burnings from the uh, oil from the uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, when the war started, I was um, 10 and living on the farm. My life in Brooklyn was uh, pretty uh, routine. We were all gathered around very tightly 
around this radio. And that's how we found out. And the news flash came on that, uh, that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. I guess from my perspective, I was too young to kind of, but I think everything was, uh, everybody was aware of the situation and everybody was there helping. I know for a fact that my parents started having a victory garden and since we had a big yard, we planted our own uh, vegetables. We worked. We had um, scrap drives, we rolled bandages, we did everything that we could for the war effort. We were very determined to be involved. I remember going down with my ration books in my one pocket and uh, a certain amount of cash in the other. And when you go, went into the store, the first thing they wanted to see was the ration books. Because they were very careful that you weren't overusing those. There was a lot of pride and a lot of, uh, of feeling of, of um, loving our country so much that we were very grateful that we had people who would go over there and, and fight for us. So we knew that they were fighting for us. Many of my neighbors who were much, much older than I am volunteered for the uh, 442 or the 100th Infantry for the U.S. Army. Uh, right thereafter. And we want people to remember that those people give their lives to make sure they didn't get over here on to us, the U.S. Well, I was glad I could do it for my country. Thank you, sir. Pearl Harbor reshaped America. Why is it important for us to continue remembering that event today, 80 years later? Earlier this week, I sat down with Mike Hagee, the CEO and president of the Admiral Nimitz Foundation. Here's what he had to say. We know that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Many historians are still disagreeing about what led up to the initial attack. But why is our understanding of these events still relevant today? Uh, thanks, thank you for that uh, question, Karen. Um, you know, the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred 80 years ago. And as we've discussed and you have discussed uh, here in this commemoration, uh, Pearl Harbor Day is a day that we commemorate uh, those uh, 2,403 servicemen and women who were killed on that, uh, on that day. And, you know, for over 80 years, uh, veteran groups have been coming together to commemorate Pearl Harbor. But those groups are becoming smaller and smaller each day. And in not the too distant future, we will know, we will lose that human link to what occurred. Uh, so we should honor what they did on that particular day. But I think we should also think about the impact that the attack on Pearl Harbor had on both us and the, and the rest of the world. Today, here in the United States, uh, a lot of people believe that uh, it was a foregone conclusion on who was going to win World War II. Uh, I can tell you, in the uh, uh, there in the winter of 1941, and that was uh, that was not the case. When you think about it, Japan had already uh, expanded into Manchuria, Upper Mongolia, and China in the 1930s. Germany started uh, World War II uh, when it attacked into Poland on the 1st of September, 19. 39. Japan joined Germany and Italy one year later in uh, September of 1940. And then Germany uh, ignored its non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union and attacked into the Soviet Union in June of 1941. So during this time, both Japan and Germany had experienced 
expanded their areas significantly and had had great successes in operations in their respective areas. During the same period of time, here in the United States, there was a very strong isolationist movement that firmly believed that we should not get involved in what was going on either in Europe or in Asia. The attack on Pearl Harbor changed that. As we all know, the United States declared war on Japan the following day. And Roosevelt and his advisors actually discussed whether they should declare war on Germany. But they left that on the table because they believed if they would have, there would have been serious opposition in the U.S. Congress. Well, on the 11th of December, and Germany made that a non-issue when it declared war on the United States. Uh, later that same day, uh, we declared war on Germany and essentially did away with all meaningful opposition to entering the European war at that time. So besides those relevant lessons of unpreparedness, and sitting on the sideline amidst a true existential threat uh, to our country and our, and, uh, and our way of life, I think there are some other uh, relevant lessons that we can take from the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. Right after it occurred, there were several commissions that were set up to find out what happened and who was responsible. As we all know, essentially Admiral Kimmel was, is the one who took the brunt of those investigations. There was very little thought about holding uh, individuals in Washington, D.C., either uh, senior military or civilians, accountable. And in my opinion, what that led to are is the inability to correct issues that were going on, especially as far as, it is, as, as intelligence is concerned. So we should continue to commemorate this date that will live in infamy. To remember those individuals who, who served so well during that attack on Pearl Harbor. But one of the best ways, I believe, that we can honor them is to remember those relevant lessons from Pearl Harbor that can serve as an example for future presidents and senior commanders who will still have the responsibility to protect this country and to properly use our armed forces. And that responsibility will never diminish. We hope that as you think about Pearl Harbor today, you remember the lives lost, those who survived, and those families that were forever changed. We hope that you remember their stories. Thank you for joining us today.